Our text this morning is Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. I know on the board it says 1 through 12, but we'll read one more verse, 1 through 13. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said." After the sermon, we will sing together in response, hymn 44, all five stanzas. Hymn 44, stanzas 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the last time that we had seen Moses and Aaron and all of the people of Israel, the Hebrews, they ended up in an absolutely awful situation. Moses had gone to Pharaoh for the first time, and he had relayed the will of God to Pharaoh that Pharaoh must let the people of Israel go out into the wilderness and worship the Lord as their God. And Pharaoh had responded by multiplying the harsh, heavy burden of slavery that they were already subjected to. From that point on, the Israelite slaves wouldn't be given any straw as raw material for the bricks that they had to make. They had to gather it themselves, and they had to still keep up with the quota of production that they were supposed to produce. Their spirits were broken, as we read. The foreman... These are the Hebrew supervisors over the labor. They were beaten when they didn't meet the the daily quota for the bricks. Everyone was angry with Moses and Aaron, and they were discouraged as well. And Moses, in faith, Moses in trust, he goes straight to the Lord and he asks, Why? Why is this happening? Why am I even here? What is God doing? What is God's plan? What could his plan be that includes such hardship for his people? And we read how the Lord answered Moses in chapter 6. He says, I am the Lord. And he is going to be revealing who he is in a very special way. We read there in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. 
And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. And I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will Give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. He begins and ends these promises by saying, I am the Lord. And you're all going to see this. God is setting the stage here to reveal who he is. Not only to the people of Israel, to his people whom he loves, but also to show himself to all of Egypt as well. Chapter 7, verses 4 and 5. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt. He's about to show himself. The Lord will rescue his people and he will act powerfully and terribly against the land that is afflicting them and against the land that is rejecting him. So our theme for this morning, the Lord begins to carry out judgment over Egypt. We'll see first of all, the judgment on Pharaoh and then judgment over Egypt's gods. Judgment on Pharaoh. Remember back in chapter 5 when Moses had first gone in and spoke to Pharaoh about all of this? What was Pharaoh's initial response to this before uh, the new edict about the bricks? Chapter 5, verse 2, Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh says, I don't know him. I don't care about him. He doesn't believe the God of Israel to be a God worthy of his worship or, or even worthy of, of any concern at all. I don't even need to think about him. He's nothing in Pharaoh's eyes. And here, God intends to show Pharaoh and God intends to carry out judgment over Pharaoh himself. God is a God of justice, a God of judgment. And when he divinely exercises these things, he does so in a way that is awe-inspiring and praiseworthy. God will be worshipped and praised in the way that he carries out judgment here. We might think of the way that God had spoken to Abraham Back in Genesis 15, when, when he spoke about all this for the first time, he promised that the people of Israel would come out of Egypt, but then he also said they would conquer the land that God was giving to them, the land of Canaan. But it wouldn't happen yet. Why? Because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. God does not overreact to evil. God judges perfectly and justly. There at that time, God was going to patiently wait for generations for the wickedness of the Amorites, they're called there the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, wait for generations for their wickedness to reach such a, a pitch, such a height and, and, and volume that God's act of judgment on them would be in perfect accord. We can see some of the same here with Pharaoh. God does not destroy Pharaoh hastily, but God is hardening Pharaoh's heart, as it says in verses 3 and 4. He says there, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts 
of judgment. Now, this may be a little bit confusing to us. Is it Pharaoh's fault if God is taking credit for hardening Pharaoh's heart? That doesn't really seem fair, does it? Well, we should understand what it means, this hardening of Pharaoh's heart, understand what it means and what it doesn't mean that God is hardening Pharaoh's heart. It does not mean that if left to himself, Pharaoh would have turned to God with a soft and repentant heart, as though Pharaoh's default position would be one of faith and trust in God. This is not the case. Rather, God is withholding the gift of saving grace from Pharaoh and instead is providing many opportunities for Pharaoh to reject the Lord and to go against him. Pharaoh all the while is growing in his resolve against God and against his people. God is at work here. His plan is being carried out, and his plan includes Pharaoh's stone-like, stubborn rejection of God. Pharaoh is being hardened in sin, according to the plan of God. Until, until the appointed time for his judgments to be seen. The grace of God that softens hearts. It's something that God doesn't owe to anyone. It, it's a gift. It's a gracious and loving gift. We all, all, all of us, every single one of us, are by nature those who have hard hearts against God. We would reject God with our whole heart, soul, and mind. We read this in the form for baptism. We are, by nature, dead in sin. We're subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation. We're conceived and born in sin. But we have had that wonderful picture and promise this morning, didn't we? God has promised to deal favorably with these two sons of his. He's adopted them. He has become their father. And they received the sign and seal of the washing away of their sins and of the Holy Spirit's work in their hearts. What a gift of grace. These are gifts that God gives. We can give thanks that the Lord deals with us so graciously in ways that we certainly do not deserve. God is the one who softens our hearts so that we love him and we embrace him with our whole heart, soul, and mind and with all our strength. And by faith in Christ, we receive the righteousness of Christ with which we are clothed on the day of judgment. We receive the forgiveness of all of our sins. We do not need to fear the judgment of God for our sins. In that first prayer before baptism, may they at the last day appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ your Son. God has given us full salvation through Jesus Christ. Here in Exodus, God is preparing his act of salvation for Israel, and he's going to display something amazing. Judgment not only against Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but also against the gods that they worship. That's the second point here. Have you wondered what the meaning was behind that miraculous sign that Moses and Aaron do in front of Pharaoh? What's going on there? Why does this happen before immediately before the plagues start unfolding. Why didn't it go straight to the plagues? What is the meaning with the staff turning into a stake, snake and everything that goes with it? Well, in a way, the main idea that is going to be taught and communicated in the plagues, which 
we deal with later, we'll deal with uh, in coming weeks. The main idea that is taught and communicated in the plagues is contained here in this episode with the magicians and the snakes. So to recap what happens there, Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh. Aaron, Moses, speaking for God. Moses is as God before Pharaoh. Moses instructs Aaron to throw his staff down and it becomes a serpent, a snake. Pharaoh calls his magicians, by their secret arts, they are able to do the same thing. So Aaron's staff has become a snake. It's slithering around on the ground, and the magician's staffs are also doing that. And then Aaron's staff slash snake eats all the others. Okay, so what is going on with that? Well, number one, Moses and Aaron perform a miracle in order to show the power of God. What is the purpose of this? This is what is supposed to happen. When Pharaoh sees this, he ought to acknowledge that God is the creator. He's the only God. He is the sustainer, and he is to be worshipped. But his magicians do a miracle too with their secret arts. We have to see this as satanic They didn't just do sleight of hand like, you know, modern magicians do, trick the eyes sort of thing. We have to see this as satanic, demonic activity. They are worshiping counterfeit gods in the demons. Yes, they're able to do this trick. They have power. The demons have power. God allows them to. But God is the only God, and compared to him, all other gods are nothing. The serpent, which was probably a a cobra, was a symbol of power and authority in Egypt. There was even a a snake goddess in Egypt named Wajet, and and the hieroglyph for her was, was the image of a cobra. So it's a showdown here. Who really has the power in Egypt? The power of God completely overcomes the false gods of Egypt. Aaron's staff swallows up the others. This is what will be proclaimed over and over again in the plagues that are to come. This is like a prologue to that. God is the one who has authority. God is the one who controls the sky and the land and the water, not the spiritual forces that are feared and worshipped in Egypt. God will bring to nothing every power that raises itself against him and against his anointed. This is the glorious victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we are able to enjoy and celebrate today. It seems that especially for Western Christians. This isn't something that that is thought about much, or at least as much as it ought to. The spiritual nature of, of warfare, the spiritual forces that are at work. During the time of the Reformation, there certainly seemed to be a much higher awareness of the presence of the spiritual forces of darkness, but it seems to some degree it's, it's sort of in the back part of our thoughts. We don't think about this every day, and this, this, that's not good. If you spend time in, in, in a culture that is very aware of the spiritual realm and of the powers of evil that are at work in the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ is exceedingly beautiful for that reason. The gospel of Jesus Christ and his victory over Satan and demons is something that is loudly proclaimed and celebrated. It's a truth that changes their lives immediately. When they hear that proclaimed, people that used to every single day live in fear of of sorcery and witchcraft, 
In Papua New Guinea, for example, it's everywhere and people are afraid of it. They live in daily fear of this. But they hear the gospel. That Jesus has all power and authority in heaven and on earth. And he is putting all of his enemies under his feet. For someone to hear that and learn that tomorrow is going to be different because now I do not have to fear evil spiritual forces anymore. What great life-changing news. But we must be warned about this too. In Ephesians 6, we're instructed and warned to put on the whole armor of God. Why? Verses 12 and 13 in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Our spiritual enemies are dangerous. They have been defeated through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Complete victory is his, but they still want to destroy as much as they can before they are finally judged and completely done away with. But we have confidence. We have confidence that the Lord Jesus Christ is putting his, his foot on their necks and they can do nothing without his permission and authority. That is what's being proclaimed here in this text. The Lord will demolish every force that raises itself against him. And it's for that reason that we can be confident that we are able to fight them well. The prayer of baptism that we prayed together is a very confident prayer. We prayed for these, especially these two boys. May they live in all righteousness under our only teacher, king, and high priest, Jesus Christ. May they valiantly fight against and overcome sin and the devil and his whole dominion. We have confidence in that. So may we forever praise and magnify God and his son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one only true God. Amen.